Welcome to another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast, a podcast about the environment in Canada by Sierra Club Canada. I'm Jessica Murray, Sierra Club Canada's Ontario Director, and today I'm going to be talking with Ole Hendrickson about Canada's first proposed permanent nuclear waste disposal site in Chalk River, known as NSDF, Near Surface Disposal Facility. Today, Ole and I cover a long timeline with roots in World War II and the beginning of research to design nuclear weapons all the way to today, where over 100 municipalities and 10 Algonquin First Nation tribes are fighting to protect both the old growth forests in Chalk River, Ontario, as well as ensure the Ottawa River and our drinking water doesn't become contaminated with radioactive waste. For those of you who like science, get ready for some nerdy terminology. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular new updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us. So before we get started, just a quickie intro on who I am. Again, I am Jessica Murray, and this is my first ever podcast recording. I live in so-called Toronto, Ontario, am a multidisciplinary artist, a literal tree hugger, and a neurodivergent mama to twins who are now three. My work with Sierra Club has had me in the role of grassroots organizer, and I am a huge proponent and believer that individuals that join communities can have incredible impact while having a lot of fun. And today, I have the great joy of interviewing Ole Hendrickson, who is Sierra Club Canada's president on the board of directors. A fun fact, Ole, originally from the U.S., actually hitchhiked to Canada in 1969 and actually passed by Chalk River, which we'll be talking about today, and as, is the home to uh, the birthplace of nuclear arms race, where scientists and engineers from all over the world assembled to learn how to make nuclear weapons. In his past, uh, Ole was a forest ecologist with Canadian Forest Service, a biodiversity science advisor with Environment Canada. He was a research scientist with Petawawa National Forestry and a researcher now with the Concerned Citizens of Renfrew County and Area, which is a nonprofit focused on nuclear waste management. Hi, Ole. Hi, Jessica. How are you doing today? I'm just fine. Thanks. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us. Really, really great to connect with you as always. Today, we are going to be talking about a topic that's, I think, very near and dear to you. You've been working on this for a really, really long time. And so before we get dive really into that, though, I want to take a step back because I think something that I've heard, at least, is that generally speaking in the environmental movement, Generally, people understand that fossil fuels are bad, and even though it's called natural gas, we're starting to pick up on the idea that that's also not actually natural. It's it's um, also a polluting gas. However, from what I understand, nuclear is actually one of those topics that's quite divisive. And so even within the environmental sphere, there are some people that are pro-nuclear, seeing that as a solution to climate change, and others who feel that is it really is not. And does that sound kind of about right? And your understanding of how it works? Yes, the nuclear industry, and unfortunately, some governments like to make the claim that nuclear energy is clean and non emitting, and those claims are simply untrue. There are all sorts of radioactive gases and liquids and solids that are emitted from nuclear power plants, and the wastes are <laughs> very dangerous and in no sense can be considered as clean. Yes, yeah, so you kind of just basically answered my question. So I wanted to start with like, what is the problem with nuclear? And it sounds like kind of what you just said is that there's actually, it's not, it's not clean. There's actually a lot of hazardous waste materials that comes out of it. And then the next question is like, well, what do we do with it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, the waste problem is only one of, of several um, regarding nuclear energy. There's also the cost. There's also the, the very long timelines to build and operate nuclear plants that generate electricity. But in terms of what do we do with the waste, there is 
no good solution. There are only less bad solutions for the waste, unfortunately. People tend to focus exclusively on the nuclear fuel waste, the, the spent fuel rods that come out of the reactors, but that's just really only part. Uh, the reactors themselves become radioactive during operation, and the metals and concrete and components in the reactors cannot be recycled. Uh, they have to be disposed of as radioactive waste, and some of the component, radioactive waste components are very long-lived in the contaminated steel and concrete. So, and we really haven't even, I don't think, properly grappled with the what we call the decommissioning of the reactors and what to do with the decommissioning waste from the reactors. Right. So what is it about the nuclear, the nuclear kind of energy that's so attractive then? Because it seems like it's really grabbed quite a few people you know, and really hook them to believe that it's a really important part of the solution. What I've heard is like, we need nuclear. I've also heard, what else have I heard? I've heard, um, well, on the flip side as well, I've heard that the government heavily subsidizes nuclear. So it seems actually more affordable than it is. Can you speak to any of that? I think part of the attraction is just the immense energy contained in the atom. Mm -hmm. When the atom is split, mass is converted to energy. And even small changes in, in mass represent huge amounts of energy. So the the actual mass or weight of fuel that's required to generate huge amounts of electricity is very small. So that makes it attractive. People think, oh, we don't, we, we, you know, all this energy that's contained in a very small quantity of, of matter is, is, is available. But again, that's problematic because you have to mine the uranium from which the fuel is fabricated. There's a lot of processing that goes into making the fuel and there's waste generated in every step of the way and fairly high costs as well. Mining isn't cheap, refining isn't cheap and so forth. So I think that isn't widely appreciated by the decision makers who who have sort of latched on to the idea that this is this is the way to go. And in terms of subsidies, people tend to forget that really the only crown corporation, federal crown corporation that's devoted to energy production in Canada is Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, which was created in 1952 specifically to help generate uh, nuclear power. But we don't have a crown corporation for uh, renewable energy, for example. So it's it's a historical artifact, and we really haven't investigated the return that the taxpayers have received for a huge, huge investment. Many tens of billions of dollars have gone into uh, nuclear power, and particularly Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. And, and have we really gotten our money's worth? What's the value for, for money? And are we really continuing to to sort of take a lot of uh, tax money and put it into something that that really isn't uh, generating value. Yeah, I, I honestly feel a bit confused and maybe you can help clarify this because it just seems like I like to assume that our legislators and decision makers would be very sound, you know, like reasonable people making good decisions based on good science. But it just sounds like something that would cost a lot of money, create a lot of waste. And then it also, when you add into the equation that we're not even sure what the value is in return, what am I missing here as to why it's so alluring that we want to commit to this so, so like in a in an in really entrenched way? It's the history of of Canada's involvement in in the nuclear energy, which goes back to World War II, when Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt met in Quebec City and said to Canada, "Would you?" Um, help us develop nuclear weapons and establish a facility in Canada away from the the war front where our scientists can come and, and learn how to make nuclear weapons, how to extract plutonium from spent fuel. That was initially the Montreal Laboratory and then quickly became the Chalk River Laboratories, which are on the Ottawa River, about 175 kilometers northwest of, of Ottawa. So people from around the world, the French, the British, 
they they came and they studied nuclear energy. They split uranium, they split thorium, and they uh, learned how to make nuclear weapons. And then they went home and started up their own nuclear weapons program. But in Chalk River, they we also were proud in, as Canadians to develop the can-do heavy water reactor, which has provided a lot of electricity for, for Canadians. So we haven't got nothing out of our investment. I don't mean to, to, to say that at all. It's just that I think looking back over the history, over the amounts of money that have been spent, it's, it's pretty clear now that there are better ways to meet our electricity needs than continuing investment in nuclear power. That's really, really helpful to clarify. And I love the uh, historical context that you've given me there. So if I'm clear, then it really is just about this kind of following a lineage that was so um, entrenched in the, in this history and then kind of bringing it forward. They're still kind of just like, oh, look, we don't want to let go of it. Is that part of the story then? That's definitely part of it. Yes. I see, that's fair. And the liberal minister of uh, munitions and supplies, C. D. Howe, which is a name that's familiar to many people, was was very hands-on in terms of the decision to create Chalk River Laboratories and then in 1952 to make the Crown Corporation Atomic Energy of Canada Limited as a public investment in nuclear power. Okay, so that's a great, I think, historical backstage. And now I kind of want to get into more of what you've been doing these days. So I'll admit, when I went into this, it was a lot of acronyms and a lot of big names. And I think just before we kind of dive into the actual story, it might be helpful to get a sense of like the lay of the land and we could set the stage together. So <laughs> there's NC, SNC Lavalin, who is now rebranded to Atkins Realis. There's CNL, CNSC, and then their project NSDF. So why don't we unpack that a little bit first? Because I think generally speaking, at least when I start seeing acronyms, I just find it gets so technical and it's like real work to really dredge through it. So I'm hoping that this uh, podcast for our listeners will help them kind of just hear it as a story, which is much more enjoyable and easier to follow. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll try. So before 2014... Basically, there was Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, AECL, which was that Crown Corporation established in 1952 by uh, C.D. Howe and, and the Act of Parliament. So and they were very slowly and diligently trying to deal with the legacy waste that had accumulated at Chalk River from decades of nuclear research. But the government of the time, the government of Stephen Harper, thought that by bringing in the private sector to uh, deal with the waste, that they might bring efficiencies and cost savings for taxpayers. So, so what was done, it was a two multi-step process. Actually, back in 2011, they took the reactor division of ACL, the CANDU reactor division, and they sold that to SNC Lavalin. In 2014, the Harper government created a subsidiary of AECL called Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And they, at that time, were looking at creating a contract, a private sector contract, which would include operating all of Canada's nuclear facilities, that's Chalk River and several others that AECL had developed. And so in 2015, in September, the newly created Canadian Nuclear Laboratories division of ACL was sold to a consortium with uh, companies from the UK, from the US, and SNC Lavalin. And they got a 10 year contract. We don't know uh, how much uh, that was worth in 2015, but obviously well over $10 billion because every year since they've been getting about a billion dollars a year to operate Chalk River and several other federal AECL facilities. And I, we think, and this is all speculative because so much of this is, is, is not available to the public through access to information, but we think that one of the reasons that they were the successful bidder for that contract, this consortium, which now consists of the former SNC Lavalin and two Texas companies called Florin Jacobs, we think the reason they got the contract was they 
came up with a plan to dispose of a lot of the legacy waste at Chalk River and other federal sites as quickly and cheaply as possible. And that was basically a, a glorified municipal landfill in the you know, on the Chalk River property, about a kilometer from the river and very close to uh, where the um, reactors at in what they call the active area at Chalk River are located. So this landfill proposal was almost immediately announced in, after they, the September 15 contract was awarded to this consortium. Started hearing about, yes, there's going to be a what they now call a near-surface disposal facility, but basically a landfill in the Perch Creek Basin in a sort of a hillside next to wetlands that drain into a 45-hectare lake called Perch Lake, which drains into the Ottawa River about a kilometer away. The more we initially, I thought, well, if they're helping clean up this Chalk River site and all the historic contamination, this could be a good thing. But the more we learned about this, the more we thought this is the wrong type of facility. We need something much more secure than a landfill. And it's very definitely the wrong location, only one kilometer from the Ottawa River. And this is the, this is the project at N is NSDF, which is near surface disposal facility. Is that right? Did exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And just to kind of clarify to everybody what NSCF, it's kind of like what it looks like. Something that I wanted to, was very curious about when I was looking into it. So what we're kind of expecting is a large grass mound, which is going to hold 1 million cubic meters of low level radioactive waste. And as to whether it'll all be low level is kind of another topic for conversation. But just to kind of try to give you a bit of context of the size of this. So that would be 400 Olympic swimming pools worth <laughs> of nuclear waste a kilometer away from the Ottawa River. And for the next 500 years, we're expecting this 400 Olympic swimming pool worth of radioactive toxicity to be there. To do that, it looks like they would also be removing 37 hectares of old growth forest to do that. And again, just to give a sense of context of a, kind of like an everyday piece of item that you might be able to multiply in your mind. That would be 92 and a half football fields of old growth forest. Hang on, the last piece, just to add to the layer of complexity of this whole situation, is the indigenous in here. I think there are 11 Algonquin First Nations that have formal status under the Indian Act. And the 10 that are in Quebec have all expressed uh, their opposition to the project. Canada has agreed to respect the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mm -hmm. And Article 29.2 of that declaration says that no storage or disposal of hazardous waste on the territories of Indigenous people shall occur without their free, prior, and informed consent. However, when this consortium came in in 2015 and made this proposal, which we started hearing about, almost immediately after they got their contract. They'd already picked the site. They'd already picked the type of facility, the landfill type mound, seven stories high, and you know, however many football fields big. And um, uh, there was no consultation whatsoever. There was no prior informed discussion, no planning phase. They just had come up with their proposal and they've been defending it ever since for eight years saying this is this is our way of doing it, and it's our way or the highway. Basically, you're gonna you're gonna approve this. And unfortunately, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Canada's nuclear regulator, has never turned down anything from the industry. They're widely regarded as just a an industry enabler. And on January 8th, they they said, "Yep, no significant adverse." environmental impacts of this massive permanent nuclear waste facility one kilometer from the Ottawa River, Canada's first ever permanent facility for permanent disposal of uh, waste from nuclear reactors. It's just, it, it, it's really uh, hard to grasp how really shocking it would be to proceed with this particular project. 
Yeah, I think the word that comes up for me is like mind boggle. I'm like, are we seeing different facts? Are we <laughs> are we living in completely different worlds? Like, how can you decide that you're going to remove 37 hectares of old growth and say that there'd be no adverse effects whatsoever? That just seems like kind of in and of itself, like something is really clearly confused between maybe the language that we're using or something like that. In an article that you were recently quoted in, by iPolitics, you said that basically the nuclear governance system is broken. And so I kind of think we're kind of alluding to that already, but it sounds like to me, the CNSC is both a regulator and a promoter. And that just seems like an inherent <laughs> conflict of interest. Can you uh, can you speak to that? Yes. I mean, the Minister of Natural Resources, uh, Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, is um, in charge of the Crown Corporation Atomic Energy Canada Limited. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission reports through Minister Wilkinson to Parliament. The head of the Safety Commission reports directly to Minister Wilkinson. And Minister Wilkinson is charged with promoting nuclear energy under something called the Nuclear Energy Act. Not many Canadians know we have a Nuclear Energy Act, and that's what allows the government of Canada to keep investing in Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. And, and it really calls on him to promote nuclear power. And his um, there's, a, there's a whole staff in his department that, that are devoted to that. So having him so tightly associated with the regulator is in and of itself a, a serious problem. And, and uh, an issue that um, we don't think the International Atomic Energy Agency, the safety standards internationally, would really condone that sort of close relationship between a department that promotes nuclear power and a regulator that supposedly prevents it from causing harm. But on top of that, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission itself has basically, a, it's like a revolving door. People go to work for ACL, and then they go to work for the CNSC. They work for Canadian Nuclear Laboratories back to CNSC. The former president, Rumina Velshi, worked for the part of Ontario Power Generation that, that is promoting new nuclear reactors. She was in charge of that. And then she went to the CNSC. And so, I mean, I mean yes, there is sort of a limited talent pool for nuclear engineering, nuclear science, but the lack of any clear arm's length relationship between the industry and the regulator is a really serious problem. In 1952, when the Atomic Energy Control Act was created, the, the regulator was actually instructed to promote nuclear power. And then when they reformed the act, in 1997 created something called the Nuclear Safety and Control Act, that dual purpose of promoting and regulating was, was supposedly changed, but the culture of the organization never did change. So the, the regulator is still very much a promoter. They're very strong promoters of what are called small modular reactors. They secretly lobbied the Trudeau government to exempt small modular reactors from the Impact Assessment Act and succeeded. So there are regulations under the Impact Assessment Act that say that reactors under a certain size do not require environmental assessment, which is just absurd. I mean, these are experimental new reactor types that, that definitely need to be carefully scrutinized. And there's a lot of expertise in the public to do that. And, and yet, they're not going to be under the act unless things are changed under the regulations of the Impact Assessment Act. So it's not the Nuclear Safety and Control Act has never been reviewed by Parliament since 1997. And the Impact Assessment Act really needs to be changed too to put the assessment of, of, of nuclear power into independent hands. And we also think that the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is very weak in terms of assessing things like decommissioning and management of waste. And that should also be in, in a separate arm's length agency, as is the case in nearly all other countries that have nuclear uh, power plants. 
like in history, it sounds like they had gotten the private corporations to come and step in because it'd be the most efficient, it'd be the quickest way to do it, and hopefully the safest. <laughs> but it's now it's like um they've got that, but then it's like at the same time, you have this like body of experts and scientists and engineers that are kind of saying, like, wait a second, we're like actually like very happy to tell you that's wrong. <laughs> And they don't even have to pay extra for that. Like that information is right there for them. And at the same time, they're still saying, no, we're going to go this other direction. And that's really kind of um, very, very mind boggling. And then the other thing that strikes me is that kind of like when we talk about the regulator also being the promoter and uh, this like kind of like a little silo where you get to change the rules for yourself so that the promotion is easier. And that's kind of like when I was in law school was something that I saw, especially in the environmental law kind of area where it was like, oh, well, you know, here's the law, but crown's exempt. And here's the law, but we can change it so that like, you know, these guys over here, I like to I like to call them like the fossil fuel baddies can kind of like fit under the criteria that they need to get the permit that they want. And we're definitely seeing that being chipped away in the Environmental Assessment Act in Ontario in particular, right? So a lot of kind of this like, uh, what is it called? Kind of, I don't know what the term they're using, but it's like, they're basically like kind of like green stamping, you know, all these projects, like so long as they fit under criteria that have been, you know, they're trying to amend at the same time. So it really is really hard to kind of call it out in some ways at the same time. Let's talk more about NSDF and biodiversity, because I think that this is like, I think biodiversity and like the lives of animals and the forest ecosystem is something that people can like tangibly relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us more about the story there. The First Nations that were not properly consulted in 2022 insisted on being able to go to the site where this facility would be built and see what's there for themselves. Um, go on to the Chalk River Laboratories property. And what they found was very interesting. Right now, there are active bear dens in that 37 hectare track. So the bears are hibernating as far as we know. They may have cubs. And there are regulations, provincial regulations in Ontario that say you can't disturb a bear den. And if there are endangered turtle species, there are endangered bat species, at risk um, migratory bird species, and a, a healthy population of eastern wolves, the, the wolves that are found in Algonquin Park in surrounding areas. And, and Chalk River isn't that far from Algonquin Park. And we've learned a lot about eastern wolves, that they are actually probably a distinct species from the gray wolf, from the uh, timber wolf of the north. And they're highly at risk. Um, there are only a few remaining populations in sort of larger protected areas like Mont Tremblant and Algonquin Park. And it looks like they may actually be using the, the Perch Creek area to, to go back and forth between across the river between Ontario and Quebec. So it could be an extremely important corridor for maintaining the genetic viability of the threatened eastern wolf, um, which is a unique species, apparently. And we're learning a lot about it. And they they prey on moose and deer. I guess you can think of it this way. Chalk River is off limits, basically, to the public. And when they put the fence around it like 80 years ago and created this, this facility for research and nuclear weapons and nuclear power, they, they stopped basically logging the area. So the, so the forests have grown up, the, the uh, all kinds of wild species have sort of moved in and made it their home. And there's some pretty seriously contaminated parts of the property and, and maybe some of the moose aren't as healthy as, as we might like, or the beaver, because they've been feeding on some contaminated vegetation. But, but still, it's, it's extremely important habitat for a wide variety of, of species. And the environmental impact statement really done by the proponent, done by Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, did not look in real detail about the species that were there and does not 
propose any effective mitigation measures? How do you deal with removing this really important habitat, this 37 hectares of, of high value mature forest with a home to lots of endangered species? They just don't address that. So we, Sierra Club, have written to Minister Gibo saying, please don't issue a permit for destruction of this habitat under the, you know, the Species at Risk Act. Uh, not, apparently, the proponent would need a SARA permit to, to destroy the habitat. And, and we're saying it hasn't really been properly assessed and take a step back. And But frankly, we just don't think this particular location is at all appropriate. They could find much, much better places to, 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 to deal with the, the legacy waste. So why did they pick this site? It was purely because it was the closest they could find and, and that we, they would save on hauling costs because a lot of the buildings, they're, they're, they're demolishing a lot of the old buildings dating back to the late 1940s on the what they call the active area, Chalk River, and they just wanted to uh, move them uh, as little as possible and, and save as much on, on trucking those demolition wastes to the nearest possible location. That's And they say that, basically. It, it was purely done for, for economic reasons um, with no real consideration of value for species at risk. So these this waste that they're trying to dispose of right now is actually not from like a nuclear power plant. It's just from historically when they were working on the nuclear weapons. Is that right? No, to make nuclear weapons, you need nuclear power plants. Canada, okay, it, <laughs> the, the National Research Experimental Reactor, the NRX, which first opened in 1947, was the largest reactor of at, at the time. And the, yeah, a lot of the waste have resulted from taking the irradiated fuel from the NRX and NRU reactors and dissolving, well, mostly the NRX, and dissolving it in concentrated nitric acid. So you're dissolving the fuel with all its uranium and plutonium and, and fission products, and you're extracting the plutonium. And then you've got all the liquid waste other than the plutonium to deal with. And some of those wastes were accidentally dumped or um, there were explosions, there were accidents in some of the buildings where this was being done. So, yeah, the waste has what we call long live alpha emitters. It has not just uranium, plutonium, thorium, radium, neptunium, americium, it, it, the the and a whole suite of isotopes of all those elements. Some of those elements are completely artificial, and and many of the isotopes are are are, are man-made, and some are very long-lived. Yeah. So, so that's I mean, that's that's the problem. The waste is all contaminated with, and and I don't know if you know what an alpha emitter is, and but it's a substance that goes undergoes radioactive decay by splitting off basically a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons, an alpha particle, fairly heavy particle. And when it does that, those alpha particles are not super high energy. So it's not like gamma radiation or x-rays. So they don't pass through your body. But if they get into your body, they're extremely toxic and extremely damaging. You'll get lung cancer. And the radiotoxicity of, of alpha emitters is extremely high. So if you just leave them on the surface if, where they can move into the water or the dust is a particular problem. If, if you breathe in alpha emitters, some of them will like, you know, radon is one of the products of these of all these artificial and alpha emitters. It's an alpha emitter itself. It gets it's a gas. It gets in your lungs. It decays to polonium. The polonium decays really fast. It's quite radioactive. And, and so you really want to keep these out of the biosphere. And that's what international safety standards say. If you have long-lived alpha emitters, they cannot be left in a facility on the surface. They can't even be put in a what's called a near-surface disposal facility. They need to go underground. So um, what's going in the NSDF? Not alpha emitting? No, everything. Okay. 
Okay. Long-lived alpha emitters, fission product um, mixed in with things like arsenic and lead and toxic organic chemicals, PCBs, dioxins, stuff, everything. They initially said that all the waste would go into the NSDF. And then they kind of went behind closed doors with the with the CNSC, the, uh, the proponent, the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And they said, oh, we've changed it all. So it, now it's only low-level waste. And they like to say, oh, and that's mops and gloves and shoe covers and you know maybe some building material and contaminated soil but when you really delve into what's at chalk river and also what's at white shell which is a similar facility in manitoba that they're decommissioning you find that you cannot separate the long-lived alpha you can't separate what they call intermediate from low level from very low level waste a landfill facility would only be suitable under international safety standards for what's called very low level waste and short lived waste, waste where the, the radioactive substances decay fairly quickly to their non radioactive progeny. But alpha emitters don't do that. They go through a long decay chain from one radioactive substance to another, to another, to another. Mm -hmm. So the alpha emitters, you got to put underground. And and it, they're very difficult to monitor and measure too. That's another problem. How do you how do you detect all this stuff? How we've been talking to scientists who worked at ACL for years on that very thing and then retired more or less when the contract was signed in, in 2015 some of them or before that. And they say, "No, this this is simply it's very very difficult to to measure these things and this is the wrong type of facility uh, to accommodate the types of mixed intermediate low level and hazardous waste that are found at these um, federal nuclear research facilities like chalk river and white shell that's really again i'm just going to say it again so mind-boggling <laughs> we could even considering this because this is already uh, how old is this waste now because you said it started in the 45 or so oh. Yeah, and, and there it's expected to stay there, from what I've read, for the next 500 years. So <laughs> that just seems like kind of crazy. Like, wh well, like, even if we got to 500 years without, you know, a leak or a spill or any sort of runoff into, into contaminating our water, what happens after 500 years? It's just the long-lived ones just keep giving off their radioactive decays and their alpha particles and beta particles and gamma radiation. And they'll many of them will do that for... Uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of years or millions or even billions in the case of U-238 and thorium-232. So, yeah, no, you're stuck with stuff that you can't leave on the near surface. And that they're still suggesting that we do. Is that well, right? that's the plan, unfortunately. <laughs> but they they love to say, oh, it's only low-level waste. And we just keep presenting evidence that that's untrue. Hmm. And it's just, it's like talking to a brick wall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there evidence in the like animal populations at all that they've been negatively affected so far? Yeah, the cable whack people found a moose that they thought had a lot of blood in its urine. Hmm. There there have been some assays of, of, of moose that show really high tritium levels. Uh, some of the internal studies done by ACL have shown that the levels of radiation already in some of the waste areas that uh, that are leaking exceed the limits for um, the safety of wildlife and, and mm -hmm. plants too. And uh, and of course, like you know, even if it's just the plants and the animals aren't drinking the water, which they are, you know, the animals eat the plants, and then I'm not sure, but do the First Nations people rely on the populations of animals there as? as game like are they hunting the moose and eating it or well the moose don't stay on that site they can they can wander right. off the waterfowl right. <laughs> would would land in perch lake and then fly somewhere else really hard to control. um beavers could swim you know from perch lake down perch creek into the river we just can't tell the animals <laughs> that they, they can't leave the the that facility it, it and and historically of course um they've gone to great pains, the indigenous uh, communities, to show that, document their traditional hunting, trapping, fishing activities. Mm -hmm. they're, they're also concerned about the sturgeon, 
uh, mm. another species at risk that that stretch of the of the Ottawa River into which Birch Creek drains is the probably best habitat for for lake sturgeon in, in Canada. And there's a endangered, highly endangered mussel uh, that uses the sturgeon to disperse itself called mm. the hickory nut mussel that the best populations in Canada are found in that stretch of the river. And, and it hasn't really been examined to see whether there's that hickory nut mussel is actually found near Perch Lake, but we know the sturgeon are, and mm -hmm. every reason to suspect that there should be more investigations of, of the the animals, the, the fish and mussels in the river too. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to our listeners why biodiversity matters? Like it sounds like, for example, I think the, the case of the sturgeon and the mussel are a great example of where there's just high levels of symbiosis and mutuality that if one falls, the other one's going to fall. And it's sometimes easier to relate to a bear. <laughs> but when I think of a sturgeon, I think of a mussel. Like it's a bit harder to feel like this kind of affinity towards it. So explain what that does for the overall resilience for, you know, species on earth. Like, because I think that's a really large topic that, at least for myself, like I remember and then I forget. And <laughs> being someone that really kind of feels connected to all of life more on like a heart level. Like for me, like that scientific, like, well, it means this for the survival doesn't really kind of stick in my mind as much. So I wonder from your scientific background, if you can kind of really nail that in for, uh, for us. As you say, people can relate to bears. They're, they're cultural symbols. They're, they're bear clans in indigenous communities. The bear, I think, the, is called makwa in the Anishinaabe language. So, so I mean, we can all feel some affinity to maybe some of us feel close to beavers or to moose or deer, right? whatever. But in, in biological terms, yeah, we do talk about the ecosystem services provided by how, how biodiversity benefits humans and uh, leaving intact healthy forests provides infiltration cleans up um, maintains the water cycle prevents flooding I, I did work as a graduate student on what we call riparian buffers why it's so important to leave forests that are close to water bodies to protect those water bodies against sedimentation flooding and, and pollutant runoff and so forth so I think we can all appreciate that we need a certain proportion of natural ecosystems anywhere in the landscape to maintain a good quality of life, um, air purification in cities and shade and, and climate regulation, moderation. There's so many of these benefits that you can call ecosystem services. There's a whole uh, international scientific body. I mean, everybody's heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There's also an intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. What a mouthful, eh? <laughs> IPBES. And they're like the IPCC <laughs> for biodiversity, and they do great work. And, and they've been sort of leaders, I think, in incorporating Indigenous traditional knowledge and marrying that with Western science when it comes to things like the ecosystem services that biodiversity provides. Okay, the next thing I wanted to drive home, okay, let's say in the worst case scenario that what's happening in the NSDF does run off into the Ottawa Red River. What does that mean? Because the water is going to, you know, it doesn't just stay in one place, like you say, it travels out. What does it mean for, you know, the populations? Can we even clean? Like, is it hard to clean that water? Like, what does that mean for us? And like, you know, kind of the water is something that really connects us, right? Because it's like we start in one place, but kind of travels all the way out, you know, over to the East Coast. So, yeah, I'm curious to know what, what the ramifications would be. All the evidence we have is that there is no safe level of exposure to radiation and, and these man-made radioactive substances. So the Ottawa River is a big river. So the and there's existing contamination from Chalk River today. It's not just the prospect that the NSDF could create more, which it could because they're moving waste from all across Canada to put in it. Yeah, we're concerned about what's coming off today. And, and you would say, okay, that 
is a big river. It dilutes the radiation and dilutes these nuclear substances. But you look down river and there's so many millions of people that use the river. Mm -hmm. Even if they're exposed to very low levels, some of those people may suffer cancers. And mm -hmm. that will continue for many, many, many generations. So you don't just look at the people affected today, but but our children and our grandchildren that would live in the Ottawa Valley and and downstream in Ottawa, Gatineau, Montreal area. And and so even low levels of pollutants over a very long time with a very large number of people would have some significant measurable impact. And there hasn't been a proper assessment of what that would be, how serious that could be, yeah. and how serious it could be in, in the event of, of, of like extreme weather events that might really increase the, the amounts that would be washed off mm -hmm. this mound into Perch Lake and Perch Creek and the Ottawa River. But it basically means permanent contamination of water bodies that that millions and millions of people are using today and would use for many, many generations to come. Mm -hmm. And especially with climate change changing our weather patterns so much, like who's who's to know really know what that NSDF mound is going to be experiencing in the in the near future? God forbid, you know, the forest fires end up making their way over here. Tornadoes. Mm -hmm. floods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the we worry a lot about the dust and the wind. If, if and mm -hmm. tornadoes are fairly frequent uh, and downbursts and and um, derechos and things like that, high winds and um, we've had experienced a fair number of that. And if that just and remember the the it's not they like to show pictures of the grass covered mound. It's all in place. It's like that's like fifty or more years down into the future, but there's 50 years when this stuff is going to be exposed and vulnerable mm -hmm. to the wind That's and fire. rain and, and um, snow melt and runoff and so forth. And they say, well, we're having, uh, we're hoping that a wastewater treatment plant will, will capture most of that, but not all of it. And, um, oh, goodness. and, and, um, and a, a really serious major event like we had on August 10th when the hearing was going on in Ottawa when the indigenous people from Barrier Lake First Nation were speaking in Algonquin about their opposition, we suddenly had this huge downpour that was just drumming on the roof and caused a lot of flooding in Ottawa and was way greater than the amounts of rain that were used to predict runoff in the environmental impact statement for the NSDF. And, and we just saw that, well, this is a sign that mm. this is not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm aware of the time. I want to kind of shift gears towards something a bit more positive. What in your mind is like your highest aspiration for what's going on here? So like what do you see would be changes that you would be hopeful for? Um, like especially in particular, obviously being rooted in reality and what's what's possible, but kind of like what's your like greatest aspiration for what's going on at NSCF, but also kind of like the larger overarching kind of story of nuclear and shutting it down, hopefully not setting up more waste we have to deal with later. So I've been a member of a little local group called Concerned Citizens of Renfrew County and Area for decades now. And our mission has always been to prevent pollution and clean up the the, the nuclear legacy at, at Chalk River and, and other areas like the Rothton reactor of ACL. And it's all going to take a long time and it's going to take a lot of effort. But what's happened and the good part about the NSDF is that a lot more people are aware of the issue and and I think willing to look at at solutions the in, um, indigenous communities have just been uh, fantastic in terms of their willingness to look seriously at this and in a constructive way they say consult us let's um, let's let's look at, at better ways to deal deal with this legacy of waste and also now we're seeing some interest in reform of the nuclear governance and in impact assessment systems, um, not just amongst the First Nations and local communities, but but some uh, members of parliament, like uh, the member of parliament for Pontiac, Sophie Chattel, has, has been meeting with, with, with local residents and, and is actively saying that 
she understands their concerns and and she wants to look in seriously at 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 what to do in terms of the legislative reform that that is needed to to do a better job here so there're real signs of hope that that things are changing that we can find better ways to deal with this with this long standing problem and um and that many many more people are aware of that need to do so okay that's great is there anything in particular that like a everyday person can can do to take action at all like i don't know if you guys have a petition going on or if they could email somebody Cable Wack First Nation has its own, I think, Stop Nuclear Waste uh, website. Okay. Anyway, Cable Wack is spelled K E B A O W E K. Um, okay. And I may not be pronouncing it exactly right, but yes, they've, along with uh, Kitigan City, Anishinaabe, and Manawaki, Quebec, and Barrier Lake, um, that uh, they, they, and they live traditionally in the bush. They're, they're incredible mm. um, folks. So all those First Nations are, are I think, worthy of, of, of huge support. But mm -hmm. uh, I think C Cable Act has the most information. They're the ones that led their own assessment of the site and discovered the bear dens and and uh, all the moose and deer and wolves that 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 use that site. So okay. I'd so say nice leave a link. support the First Nations in this. Yes. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's a. Uh really good to be amplifying what the work they're doing and really leading. So it's, it's a really hopeful story to be following. Okay. So in interest of time, I have one more wrap up question for you. What is, and this is, is a kind of in response to the fact that I think generally speaking, some people that are engaged with environmental issues, there's like a heaviness to it. It's not always easy to be to be looking at this kind of stuff. And so if you're still with us, we thank you for staying on with us and uh, caring enough to really listen through this sometimes really dense, but hopefully we found this kind of made this also a little bit fun for you to listen to. So my question for you all is what is your greatest resource right now to fuel the work that you do? So for example, is there an element of the work that really you find really like energizes you? Or is there a self-care practice that you commit to that really helps you to prevent from burnout and safeguard your well-being that you can share with our listeners? There's so much joy in spending time in nature. This Canada is such a beautiful country. The mm. Canadian Shield, um, all the lakes and forests are, are fantastic. So uh, last Sunday, uh, we had a little um, snowshoe outing. And it was just one of those perfect winter days with mm. blue, blue sky and sunshine and about minus nine degrees. And uh, uh, we warm. walked around the little lake in, <laughs> you know, near Algonquin Park. It was, you know, and in summer, you know, I love to, to, to camp out on those lakes in Algonquin Park. Yeah. So so nature itself and the joy mm. of, of spending time in nature uh, with, you know, I love birds. I love trees. Mm -hmm. I also do regular meditation and yoga, which um, that helps tide over between when you're not out there <laughs> in nature. But uh, the combination of those two is, is, is I find, really valuable. Mm -hmm. It's a good plug to remind everybody to get outside. And uh, me being stuck in a city is still, I find the thing that really comforts me is like the sound of the birds. And it might even just be house sparrows, but they're just so happy sounding and they're so great. So that always really brings a lot of joy for me as I walk around the otherwise very gray <laughs> kind of weather we're having right now. Anyways, oh, thank you so much for your time. It's always like such a wonderful uh, way for me to spend time is to connect with you. So thanks for all your expertise, everything you've been doing for so many years and the time you've spent to share with us today. Thank you, Jessica. It's been so great to work with you as uh, on our CR Club Canada Foundation board. And uh, I'll, I really respect the work you're doing and, as well. Hi, everyone. This is Connor Curtis, Head of Communications at CR Club Canada. I'm jumping in to answer some questions for the Q&A. And actually, we, we had a bit of a longer podcast this particular episode than we expected and so we're only going to be able to get to one of the questions that got sent in in this episode but do stay tuned for the next episode if your question wasn't answered we'll be getting to it then 
So question is, loved your podcast about are renewables responsible for Alberta grid issues? One of the main themes that came up was using batteries to store excess grid energy until that energy is required. Several articles have been appearing on CBC Digital Media that point to batteries, their production, and the fact that they are, there are a few facilities that actually extract the minerals that can be reused once the battery is discharged. As having a, a worse environmental impact, it states that the minerals required are few in existence and mining them is even worse than other non-renewable forms of energy. Can you address this? So here's our answer to that. So first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. So given what I have seen on CBC recently, I'm going to imagine this is also partially about electric vehicle batteries, as well as larger scale energy storage batteries. And there are two interrelated issues here. The first is what are the climate and environmental impacts of batteries? And the second is how do we go about making and using products, getting the raw materials and reusing products? So to answer the first issue, Batteries powered by renewables are better for the environment than non-renewable forms of energy. It is true that all energy infrastructure and energy used for transport has an environmental impact. However, the environmental impact of renewable battery power is far lower than that of non-renewable energy when you take into account the lifetime use of the resulting transportation and infrastructure. What that means is, yes, it could take more emissions even to make a, an electric vehicle than making a gasoline one. But when you include the lifetime emissions of both cars, the electric vehicle is significantly lower. This is even true when the car is powered by electricity that doesn't come from renewable sources. So if you have an electric car that's been powered by coal power, uh, although, of course, we need to be making sure that energy does come from renewables and not from fossil fuels as much as possible. And we're moving in that direction, hopefully. The major difference between reliance on renewables tied to battery power and reliance on fossil fuels is that by building up renewable energy and storage capacity, we create a system in which we can start to eliminate the need for fossil fuels and to decarbonize our society. That doesn't mean that creating the initial infrastructure for that it doesn't take up some emissions because of course it does everything in our society that's dependent upon fossil fuels does climate change uh, knows no boundaries it's a huge priority precisely because climate change getting worse makes environmental protection everywhere and every other issue a lot harder to do you know we can't fix things in the oceans through just marine protected areas they're important but climate change could make those marine protected areas uh, very much inconsequential if the, the water within them warms to such a point that you know marine life can't live there anymore uh, think about it this way if you want all of your renewable energy and battery storage to be built using power from renewable energy and battery storage well then you first need to build some renewable energy and battery storage otherwise you're just left reliant on fossil fuels and we all know that's going to end in mass ecosystem collapses which will undermine all of our other ecological attempts to protect nature so that leads into kind of the second question, right? The extraction of the elements needed for batteries and the other energy intensive processes that can be used in that respect. And while the processes used to extract elements needed for batteries are generally less harmful than those relating to oil and gas, they're not without impact. This is one among many other reasons why Sierra Club Canada campaigns for a shift to a circular economy where we focus on the reuse of materials rather than an economy based on extraction, production, and consumption. It's also important to point out that batteries aren't the only way to store renewable energy for use in a grid at a later time, and that in terms of Transport, electric vehicles are an important solution, but they shouldn't be the only focus. We also need to focus on solutions like better public transport, better biking infrastructure, and building up local community capacities so you know we don't need to ship as much to, to places and communities have more resilience. And we need to focus on building up the infrastructure to recycle batteries during this transition to renewable energy as well. That is crucially important. I hope this helps answer your question. You can send us a Q&A question for us to answer during the next podcast at info at sierraclub.ca. A reminder also that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have a ton of petitions, other actions and events and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio and YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us. As always, stay tuned and take action.